here. My name is Dr. May. In this video, we're going to look at what is a function. Now, I'm using some pretty cool tools in the Desmos um, platform so that you can see some of the techniques that we'll be using. So let's start with what is a function. And I hope as we go through the video today, you're going to be taking some great notes. So my first one is a function, we have the definition, is a rule that assigns exactly one output to each possible input. So a lot of us learn this little shortcut that helps us that I have in bold here. It says more specifically in a function, none of the inputs will or can repeat. So we're looking for the first coordinates, the first item in a pair. We want those items, the first ones to not repeat. So let's take a look at a couple of somewhat silly examples. So I've got a few here and please, I tried to make my inputs very different. So you might notice that some of my inputs are emojis, some of them are numbers, but what we're looking at is we don't want any of the first items listed to repeat. So let's look at this first one. I'm looking at my emojis and I only want to look at the ones in the first position. See, none of these repeat. So we're good. This is a function. Now let's look at the one here in the middle. Do any of the first items repeat? No, I don't see any of the first items. See, I'm not even looking at the second items. I'm only looking at the first items there. So this one also is a good function. Let's go to our third one here. Uh-oh, I see a repeat. Do you see the emoji that has the little uh, glass over the eye? Yeah, that repeats here and here. So that one's not a function. Let's go to the second row. Uh-oh, I see the negative three here in the red coordinates, but I see it also in the purple in the first position. That's a big no for the functions, right? Remember, the first items cannot repeat. Look at it in the chart. So again, we're only looking at this first column. Do any of those repeat? Negative two, negative one, one, two. Nope, no repeats there. We're good to be a function. And then here on my last one, negative two. Oh, I see the negative ones repeat. So this is not a function. So we have three functions and three that are not free functions. So just to recap, remember, function assigns only one input to every output. So we are looking for none of the inputs to repeat, none of the first items listed to repeat. But let's take a look at another one. So is this a function or not? Well, I've listed it in two different ways. I want you to notice that I have the emojis listed as an ordered pair, so you'll notice that I have the blue head within the scary face here. Then I have the one crying with the scary face. And then I've got this emoji with the happy face. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice that none of my first ones repeat. That tells me it's a function. But I also want you to see that I listed it as a mapping. So I took them and just drew a line from the first coordinate to the second coordinate. That's another way that we can represent functions. Okay, so good thinking there. Let's go to our next example. Oh, now I want to take a mapping and look if any of those first items repeat. Okay, so look at my first one. Notice that I have an input of negative one going to four. My second one, I have an input of negative two, but look, that goes from negative two to five. And negative two goes from six. So if I were to write this one as a table, look what it would look like. I would have negative one as an input and four as an input. I would have negative two as an input and five as an input. I would also have negative two as an input and six as an input. And that's for this first mapping. What I want you to see is that I can take the mapping and make a table so you can easily see how those first coordinates are repeating. All right, look at your second mapping then. I'm going to take these first values away because we already said the first mapping is not a function. Look at my second one. How would that go in the table? We would have an input of one, output of four. Let's do that. Input of one, output of four. Then I would have an input of two, output of four. 
Is it okay that the second coordinates repeat? Yes, it is. It is A-OK -okay for those second coordinates to repeat. It's the first coordinates that can't repeat. All right, and then finish up three, input of three, output of five. So this is our function. This is the one where the first coordinates do not repeat. Well done, my friends. I hope you're seeing these functions. We're giving them in different ways. Ordered pairs, table, mapping. We want to be able to identify function or not function from any of those um, representations. Okay, so let's look at a function from a graph. And we wanna use what we call the vertical line test. So a vertical line test, I'm gonna take this vertical line in orange and I'm gonna drag it. Do you see how the vertical line hits that first point and it only hits that first point? That's good. We only want it to hit one point at a time. Dragging the vertical line again, and now it hits this point. It only hits this point. We want them to hit, we want the vertical line to hit the points one at a time. Uh-oh. Notice my vertical line hits these two points at the same time. That means it's not a function. See, the vertical line can only hit the points one at a time. If it hits two of them at a time, not a function. We'll check this last one. Okay, it only hit that one, but right there, that's a problem. You can only hit the graph one at a time. And that means that this graph is not a function. Okay, let's take a look at a few more. I'm gonna press play here so you can see the vertical line drag by. You be watching to see if it hits the points one at a time. Would this be a graph or not? Let's take a look at it one more time. Notice the vertical line only hit the graph one point at a time. That means this is a function. Okay, let's do another one. Now, a great way to do this is for you to stop the video. Just press pause and see what you think. Just take your pencil, maybe a good pencil, and just drag it across that graph and see if it hits the points one at a time. Remember, if it hits them one at a time, we're good. It's a function. But if it hits two of them at the same time, it's a no-go. So take, go ahead and pause and try and see what you think. All right, now I'm gonna drag the purple line. Remember, it can only hit them one at a time. We're good on that first point. Only hit this one, one at a time. We're good here. Uh-oh. We hit three of them at the same time. That's a big no for us, right? That cannot happen, so we know that's not a function. All right, good work, my friends. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about continuous versus discrete graphs. Now, when you look at my two graphs here, you see the discrete data on the left. We have a single point, right? just some points on the graph, okay? Versus my continuous data where I actually have points, but they're connected by a line. Ooh, that's, that's interesting. So we're gonna talk about how do I do domain and range with each one of these. So if I'm looking at a discrete graph, you're going to list the domain and range values. So if you have the points just randomly listed, you're gonna list the X coordinates as your domain. And notice I just put them in a brace, curly brace, and I separated them by commas. And I do the same thing for the range. I just take the Y values and I separate them by commas and I put curly braces around them. This is if I have discrete data. Remember, discrete data are points that are located on the graph. If I have continuous data, you need to write an interval to describe the domain and range. So notice that I wrote these as inequalities. Now, 
If you're looking at it and they go, I, I, how did you get those numbers? Don't worry, we're gonna practice. What I want you to get out of this is when we do discrete data, we list the domain and range. When we do continuous data, we write a, an inequality. And remember, continuous are points that are connected by a line. All right, let's take a look at some examples. All right, so here I have some points located on this graph. And first question I wanna know is, is this discrete or continuous? And you go to a football game and the slice of pizza, the slices of pizza are $4 each. What is the range of the scenario? Okay, so is this discrete or continuous? We need to decide that first. Well, I have some points listed. Mm -hmm. And so I know that's discrete. Excellent. Okay. Because, and another way to think of this is you actually can't buy half a slice of pizza. You either have to buy one piece, one slice of pizza or two slices of pizza. So when I go to do my range, I already know I have to list them. And remember, range is Y. So I want to list the Y values. So it looks like I have zero. And notice I clicked on that so it would see the point. Four. I'm looking at the second coordinate, the Y coordinate, eight and 12. So I want to list those zero, four, eight, and 12 as my range. And that would be this one, okay? So first question when we look at these is, is it discrete or continuous? Cause that's gonna tell me, do I list them or do I write it as an inequality? Okay, let's take a look at another one. Okay, here's some points again. Um, I want to know discrete or continuous, and then I want to know what is the domain. Okay, so domain is X. So first thing, is it discrete or continuous? Well, I see these little points, so that means it's discrete. And then what is the domain? So I know with discrete, I have to list them. Okay. And let's, and I want the X coordinates. So let me click on these points. My X coordinate is negative two, zero, two, and three. So negative two, zero, two, and three. And that one has to be this last one here. Okay. So big difference when it's discrete, I list out the domain or the range, domain being X, range being Y. Now let's take a look at a few of them that are continuous because we, we know it's going to be a little different. Okay, before we do that, let's take a look at this mapping because we haven't done one with mapping yet. And mappings are always discrete because these are actually points. They're just not represented um, on a graph. So it is discrete. In fact, if it makes it easier for you and you want to write these as a coordinate point, you would write them as negative four, negative five, oh, sorry, negative four, zero, because the negative four draws a line to zero. Then you have negative one draws a line to one. Then you have zero draws a line to negative five. You can write them as ordered pairs if you want two draws a line to four and then seven draws a line to two okay so you can easily see it's discrete because it's just points there's a represented in a mapping and then so we know it's discrete so we're going to list the domain we're going to list all of those first coordinates negative four negative one zero two and seven negative four, negative one, zero, two, and seven. That's our last one here. All right. Okay, so no matter how we represent the function, we can still tell the domain and range. We just have to decide first, is it discrete or continuous? Okay, here's a great one for you. If you wanna press pause on this video to try this one, it would be really good for you to do that now that we just did an example of a mapping. Just press pause and you try to decide it discrete or continuous and then tell me the range. All right, then press play again so you can see how I do it.
All right, we just talked about how mappings were discrete. So we know that it is. If you want to write them as an ordered pair, you would write negative 7, and it draws a line to negative 1. And then negative 2 draws a line to negative 4. And then 0 draws a line to negative 1. And then 5 draws a line to negative 9. Now let's make sure this problem is asking us for the range. So that's the y coordinates. Make sure we get the difference. Domain range x, y. So we want all of the second coordinates now. Okay. So I've got negative 1, negative 4, negative 1, and negative 9. And by the way, remember, it's okay that the second coordinate has a repeat. The first coordinate cannot. So negative 1, negative 4, and negative nine, that would be this one. I get a lot of questions like, okay, so if the negative one repeated, do I have to write it twice? And the answer is no. You only write it once, even if they repeat. All right, so now we're ready to start working with some continuous graphs. And I get a lot of questions on this one. So I'm gonna do a few slides here to kind of walk you through understanding what the domain is. So this slide, I wanna drag the one of the blue points, drag one of the blue points to fix the shaded region so it covers the entire graph with the smallest interval. So you see how this blue part over here is it's part of it, but it's not part of the graph. Like the graph does not go out that far. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just draw, drag this blue dot so that it only covers the graph. Okay, now look at your X values for the blue area. So this X value, if you count it, zero be negative one, negative two, negative three. So this blue area starts at negative three. And it ends at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it starts at negative 3, it ends in 6. So I'm going to choose the inequality that says start at negative 3 and end at 6, and that's this one. Okay, so the first thing I had to do was to drag the blue dot so it covered only the graph. Then I can look at the x values to determine the domain. All right, let's try another one like that. Okay, so again, we're gonna drag the blue dots. Okay, so let me drag this one here because this is where it starts, that's a good thing. And then, oh, I've got an arrow over here. So while I did drag that blue dot all the way to 10, does it stop at 10? And the answer is no. The blue area keeps going just off the graph. So how do I write this one? Well, I know the blue area starts at this X value, which would be negative one. And it continues going all the way to the right. So how could I write that? So look at my inequalities. I see I've got this X is greater than or equal to negative one. And then I've got this negative one is, um, X is between negative one and nine. Now remember, we said we drug that blue line all the way out to 10. So the nine here is kind of messing with me. That's not making sense. So I am gonna say that X has to be greater than or equal to negative one. And that's only because, look at that arrow. That arrow tells me keep going to the right, okay? All right, let's try another one. Oh, this is a good one, okay? I'm gonna drag the blue dots so that it covers the graph. We'll stop there for the end and we'll start here. So I only want what's in this blue shaded region. So what's my first X value? It's one, but notice there's an open circle there. Ooh, if you remember back from our work with inequalities, what do we do with an open circle? That's right, we don't put the equal to underneath it, excellent. So we've got this one, but we don't want it equal to. And we've got this other X value, which would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So I want one and six, but I don't want the one included. So I got lots of options here. <laughs> so I want one not included, six included, because six had a closed circle. We remember from our inequality that we do have an equal to there. So the only one that has the one not included Notice no equal to under here, but the six does would be this one. Yeah, that's tricky, friends. 
That is tricky, but I hope with dragging this blue region is going to help you. It's, it's forcing your eyes to only look at this section of the graph. Okay. Okay. So here's one now without our blue region, right? So we have to, we have to do the blue region by ourselves. Okay. So think about drawing that blue line here. Okay. So notice my first blue line would come right here with an X value of negative four. I'm sorry, negative one. Mm -hmm. My X value is the first one. So it's going to start at negative one and I want it to keep going to the right because we think about there being like an equals, um, an arrow out here. Okay. So I'm going to say X is greater than or equal to negative one. Think about why I would have the equal to underneath it, because it's got a closed circle, right? And the domain keeps going to the right. So I want all the X's that are bigger. If, if it helps you to draw this and put the blue shading, like get you a matte pencil and shade that so that you can definitely see it, okay? All right, let's do the same thing, but this time with the range, okay? So I changed the colors so we can get mixed up, but we're gonna do the same thing with the range. This time we're looking at the Y values. So we're gonna drag the green lines to cover the graph to there and there, okay? This is forcing your eye to only look at the Y values, okay? So my lowest Y value is one, and my highest Y value is four. Notice how I'm just counting in the green here. So I want my Y values to be between one and four. Let's choose an inequality that says Y values between one and four. Now friends, look, I have two inequalities. One has an X in it. Wait, we're talking about range here. We do not want anything with X's. Let's throw that one out. We know this one is right because it's the one with one and four with our Y in there. No X's when we're dealing with range. Okay, let's do another one like that. Okay, so think about dragging your green lines to the top and to the bottom so that we only look at the portion of the graph that is um, drawn. So here's my first to the top, drag to the bottom. Excellent. Now think about what is that bottom Y value. So negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Okay, that's my bottom one. And the top one, one, two, three, four, five. So I want my Y values to go between negative four and five. Negative four and five, there we go. Well done. I hope the green here is helping you to see the portion of the graph we want to look at, and then we want to do the top and the bottom when we're dealing with the range. When we're dealing with the range, only the Y values. Okay, let's see what others I have. Okay, so now we're gonna drag the green again, but be real careful because we got that tricky arrow like we did on the previous one. So I'm gonna drag it here, but friends, as it goes off the graph, it's really gonna go all the way over there, right? Because it's gonna keep going up. And then I'm gonna drag the bottom one here. Oops, there we go. Okay, so now I gotta think. I want this lowest Y value to be at negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and I want it to go up, right? I want it to keep going up. So I've gotta say that my Ys have gotta be bigger than this negative four. That, look at that second one's tricky, right? It's saying that the arrow's not there and it stops at 10. But we know the, the arrow tells us to keep going. So we're going to say Y is greater than or equal to negative four. Hey, friends, you're doing great. Okay, just a couple more. Okay, now we're going to work backwards here. I want to change the points on the function so that it has this domain and this range. Okay, so my domain is X is greater than or equal to negative four. That means this point has got to move all the way to x equals negative four. So let me see if I can move this one. One, negative two, negative three, negative four. That's good. That works for me. And I want it to have a range of y is less than six, less than or equal to six. So I needed to go all the way up to six, but be 
below it. So let me go all the way up to six. Let's see, I was at one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, did you see how I did that? Mm -hmm. I just had to move the one green dot so that the domain would start at negative four and go to the right, which this does. I also wanted the range to go all the way up to six, but go down, which this does. So I was working a little backwards there. All right, I got one more for you. All right, on this one, we wanna look at function notation. <clears throat> you may have dealt with this a little bit before when you are told the function rule. So notice in my function here, g of x equals negative 2x plus 7. So what I want you to see is that the g here is the name of the function. The x value tells us where to put the input. So when I ask you what g of negative 3 is, what I'm saying is, what would the output be when negative 3 is subbed in for x? Let me say that again. What would the output be when negative 3 is subbed in for x? So let me sub in negative 3 here in this x. So I've got negative 2x plus 7. In place of the x, I'm going to put negative 3. And friends, I like to put that in parentheses. And then I do order of operations. So order of operations tells me to multiply first, then add. So negative 2 times negative 3 gives me 6 plus 7 equals 13. So 13 would be my answer here. Let's do one more like that. H of t equals negative 16t plus 5t plus 1. So that's telling me my function rule. And it, now the question is saying, what is h of 1? So it's saying, what is the output when you sub in 1 for t? What is the output when you sub in 1 for t? So let's see what we get. I've got negative 16t squared plus 5t plus 1. I'm putting in 1 for t. So I've got negative 16 times 1 to the second plus 5 times 1. Notice I had to put in the 1 for both t's. Mm -hmm. Now, order of operations tells me exponents first. So negative, I'm sorry, positive 1 to the second gives me just 1. And now I'm ready to multiply. All right, so negative 16 times 1, negative 16. 5 times 1, 5 plus 1. Now you can just add left to right. If that causes you trouble, definitely use that get oof, use that Desmos graphing calculator. I've linked it below for you so you can use it. Negative 16 plus 5 is negative 11. Negative 11 plus 1, negative 10 is my final value there. That's my output when my input is 1. Hey friends, we've covered a lot in this lesson. I hope it's helped you. I hope you got lots of practice with domain and range, function, notation. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Bye for now.